Hello? Hello? <clears throat> Podcast Network Asia. Network Asia. This episode may include topics, references, or discussions around sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, physical violence, or subject matters that may be disturbing to some of our listeners. We do acknowledge that this content may be difficult. We also encourage you to care for your safety and well-being. Shocking, sad, revealing, and deeply researched, PH Murder Stories podcast covers the true account of infamous killings and true crime stories from the Philippines. There's no such thing as questions, just hidden answers. Stay tuned as we revisit the inconceivable crimes that exist. Some listeners may find the following content of PH Murder Stories highly disturbing due to its graphic nature. PH Murder Stories does not condone nor promote violence of all sorts. Viewer discretion is advised. Napabilang ang Marikina sa ganyang pangyayari kasi ilang beses din nagkaroon ng mga rapist league sa Marikina. So parang tinigaruan ngayon siyang Marikina ano eh, rape capital of the Philippines. Parang Marikina, rape capital of the Philippines. Kasi sunod-sunod ang ano dyan eh, uh, panggagasa at pagpatay sa mga babae. Nakita namin si Rosalyn totally naked yun. Uh, may naka anong good morning dito, dalawang buhol na good morning na abukado ang kulay. Tapos wala, namamaga yung private parts niya. Sinakala ko na ba, mawawala na ako ng ulirat, ng ano tapos ayaw ko nang ulitin na tingnan kasi iba na yung muka. Magang-maga na iba eh. Yung, yung buhok niya, mahaba ang buhok. Naging ano eh, ginupit-gupitan ba ng pinagtripan niya ta- tapos may mga pasok-pasok. Makita ko na napatingala ako sa langit. Ang sumagi sa isip ko, bakit kayo nangyari sa akin dito samantalang wala man akong ginawang masama sa kapwa ko. Hindi ako maniwalang may Diyos. Sabi ko Lord, magpakita ka para maniwala. In the early 1990s, Marikina City earned a reputation of being the country's rape and murder capital. After a plethora of cases that popped out, which featured women being sexually assaulted and some that are brutally killed. It was a time when the Marikina local government had set its sights on becoming a city, which they eventually achieved in 1996. However, Despite the city's efforts to develop the area, crimes against women also increased. After all, who would want to go to a place that was infamously known as the rape capital of the Philippines? Before we proceed with this episode, please don't forget to follow and give us a rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. On July 7, 1993, Marikina's notoriety as the rape and murder capital of the Philippines would get emphasized after a body of a young woman was found in a covered canal located in Barangay Parang, Marikina City. According to authorities, the victim was raped and tortured before being mercilessly killed by her perpetrators. Upon seeing her lifeless body, she was naked from the waist down, her lips crushed, her private parts swollen, and a yellow-green towel bound her neck. The victim is Rosalyn Federico. She was a 22-year-old nursing student and a service crew member of Cindy's Restaurant located in SM Center Point, Santa Mesa, Manila. Rosalyn was a resident of Marikina City together with her family. She was a hardworking individual who studied and worked simultaneously to help provide for her family. The victim's family 
was devastated by the saddening incident. In an interview with a notable crime show from a recognized TV outlet, Shirley Federico, Rosalind's mother, told reporters that she was aware of Marikina's reputation for violent crimes against women. That is why, whenever Rosalind would go home late at night, she would pick her daughter up from the jeepney station to keep her safe. On July 5, 1993, Rosalind's mother had a terrible fever, which prevented her from doing the usual routine of picking up Rosalind from her jeepney stop. When it was past Rosalind's time when she usually went home, her parents initially thought she stayed at her older sister's house, located in Barangay Tanyong in Marikina City that night, because it was already late. Little did they know that the morning of that day would be the last time they would see their beloved daughter. After confirming that Rosalind did not spend the night at her older sister's house, the Federico family became worried about the whereabouts of Rosalind. They thoroughly went through all of Rosalind's family and friends to see if they could help find her, but none of them knew exactly where their daughter was. After exerting all of their efforts, Rosalind's parents decided to file a missing persons report on July 6 at Barangay Parang's Hall. A day later, the Federico family's fears came to reality. Authorities found a young woman's lifeless body in a vacant lot in Barangay Parang. According to the police, the victim's body was covered in bruises and showed clear signs of forced penetration to her private parts. Rosalind's father confirmed that the lifeless body that the authorities found was indeed his daughter's. The tragic incident broke the hearts of Rosalind's family. Faustino even questioned God's existence. He wondered why the perpetrators of his daughter's gruesome slaying would do such horrific acts. He also maintained that his family did not have enemies and that they were good people without doing anything bad in a world that brought cruelty to their precious daughter. When it seemed that the culture of rape and violence reigned over the city of Marikina, Rosalind's unmerciful killing became a spark plug for justice seekers that aimed to put an end to Marikina's reputation of being the rape and murder capital of the entire country. Rosalind Federico's case caught the national government's attention. Then-Vice President Joseph Estrada, who was also the chairman of the Presidential Anti-Crime Commission in the Ramos administration, urged the law enforcement to hasten their investigation on Rosalind's slaying. As the police heed the national government's call, to exert more effort in Rosalind Federico's gruesome killing. They went back to the place where she was found and looked for more answers. Meanwhile, a young man named Angelito came forward, claiming to have the answers to what happened to Rosalind. Based on Angelito's claim, he told authorities that he knew the perpetrators of the crime. In the vicinity of the crime, Angelito told policemen that he saw the suspects within their compound, though his parents already told the authorities beforehand that they did not see anyone in their area on the days Rosalind was still assumed to be missing until her body was found nearby. However, Angelito insisted that there was really a group of men lurking around their compound before Rosalind was found, but he wouldn't give out the names of the men that he claimed were there. The police then forced Angelito to spill out their names, which he finally did. Based on Angelito's statement, he saw three men, brothers Ramon and Zaldi de la Paz, and Joel Borlon, pass by their compound. Call 
calling all aspiring podcasters. This is your sign to start your own podcast because we have just the right tool for you. Before we started podcasting, we really thought that everything would be such a hassle, especially the editing. But we found the best and most convenient all-around podcast tool out there, Podmachine. Podmachine will take care of all your podcasting needs. From audio production, designs, and marketing worth, all you have to do is sit back, relax, and keep creating great content that sounds professional. It's time for you to start sounding like a pro with Podmachine today. Sign up and get a free episode trial. And once you're convinced of how good it can be and how it helped us, you can start for as low as only $49.99 for four episodes in a month. But wait, there's more. If you use our code PHMURDER, all caps, no spaces, you get one free episode credit upon subscribing. Just head on to podmachine.com and let them do the dirty work so you can do the fun stuff and sound like a pro. Twenty days after Rosalyn Federico's lifeless body was found, the police finally found their break after looking into Angelito's testimony. The authorities apprehended the three men, in which all of them admitted that they took part in the rape and slaying of Rosalyn Federico. The suspect, Ramon de la Paz, who was also a neighbor of the Federico family, was the first to admit his involvement in the gruesome crime. His brother, Adorable, and their friend, Joel Borlon, also cooperated with the authorities. All three also identified the other four suspects. Zaldi de la Paz, the brother of Adorable and Ramon, Edwin Habla, Melvin Magbanua, and Alan Florentino who was the said mastermind of the gruesome crime they committed. Eventually, the authorities found the mastermind in the province of Sorsogon, where he was hiding. According to the statement of the suspect that admitted to the crime, on the evening of July 5, 1992, Ramon de la Paz and Melvin Magbanua saw Rosalind go down the jeepney. Both men were highly intoxicated with illegal drugs and followed Rosalind where she was headed. When Rosalind was about 10 meters away from her home, both men grabbed her. Amid the victim's abduction, Ramon punched her to keep her from resisting. Afterward, both men dragged her to another street where a car was waiting for them. They shoved Rosalind at the back of the car where two other suspects, Alan Florentino and Zaldi de la Paz, were waiting for them. They went to an apartment in Tanguila Street, also located in Barangay Parang in Marikina City. As soon as they arrived at the apartment, the suspects tied Rosalind's hands and feet while she was lying down on the bed. They ripped apart her clothes and gagged her mouth to prevent anyone outside from hearing her cries for help. As Rosalind was lying down helpless at the mercy of her captors, the perpetrators also used illegal substances among themselves to get high before performing their brutal acts towards the victim. After drugging themselves, the vicious men took turns in sexually assaulting Rosalind. From July 5 to July 7, these heartless men forced themselves on the victim over and over again till she died. Meanwhile, the said mastermind, Alan Florentino, denied his involvement in the rape and killing of Rosalind Federico. According to an interview he granted to a known news outlet, he said that he had a physical altercation with the Federico family, a fight regarding a basketball game. Florentino also told the reporter that he had a half-brother who was beaten and stabbed in the neighborhood where the Federico family resides. When asked about his whereabouts during the time the crime took place, he maintained that he was at a family member's birthday party 
when Rosalind was supposedly abducted. Because of his significant bad blood with the Federico family, Florentino insisted that this might have led the authorities to believe that he was the mastermind of the brutal rape and slaying of Rosalind. However, the authorities did not believe Alan Florentino's sentiments. Based on the investigation, they found out that he comes from a wealthy family. There were also rumors back then that Florentino was the drug supplier in Barangay Parang, which is highly possible that he had influence over the goons and drug addicts that roamed the area. Other claims continue to resurface. According to one of the suspects, Zaldi de la Paz, he claimed that he was tortured by the police to admit his involvement with Rosalind's rape slay. As the case moves further, authorities filed rape and homicide charges against the five suspects in police custody. Two other suspects, Melvin Magbanwa and Edwin Habla, remained at large. Unfortunately, on July 25, 1996, the case suffered a setback after Judge Santiago Ranada Jr. of the Marikina City Regional Trial Court dismissed the case against the five suspects based on insufficient evidence. In his decision to dismiss the case, the judge said the five suspects' testimonies owning to the crime were given in the absence of counsel. The ruling devastated the Federico family, but they vowed to continuously seek justice for the murder of their daughter, Roslyn. Through the help and support of numerous advocacy groups, the Federico family started a campaign and garnered 1 million signatures, protesting the Marikina City judge's ruling. They also filed a motion at the Court of Appeals to reopen the case. On March 4, 1998, the Court of Appeals ordered the case's reinvestigation and transferred the venue to the Pasig City Regional Trial Court. Subsequently, the Supreme Court affirmed the Court of Appeals' decision and ordered the Pasig RTC to start hearing the case. Amid the investigation, a new witness, Enrique Magnaye, came forward and testified that he saw the suspects on board the car, unloading Rosalind's body and dumping it a few meters away from where he was standing. He also told the court that he refused to surface immediately because he was afraid of the mastermind, Alan Florentino, who belongs to a rich and influential family. Though his conscience got the best of him, he decided to move forward with his testimony. Magnaya's testimony pinned the final nail in the coffin that led to the Pasig RTC rule on behalf of the prosecution. In Judge Leo Lacebo's ruling in 2002, she found the five accused guilty beyond reasonable doubt of the crime of multiple rape with homicide. According to Judge Acebo's statement, she said she could have sent the accused Ramon de la Paz, Adorable de la Paz, Zaldi de la Paz, Joel Borlon, and Alan Florentino to the death chamber since rape with homicide was considered a heinous crime. Luckily for them, the death penalty in the Philippines was re-established in 1994, a year after the crime was committed. The judge also ordered each accused to pay Rosalind Federico's heirs the sum of 1.5 million pesos in damages. Rosalind Federico's suffering finally received the justice it deserves. She was abducted, raped, and killed by seven men that took turns in forcing themselves onto her helpless stature. No person deserves to be treated that way.
for further updates. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PH Murder Stories. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, PH Murder Stories. If you have case suggestions, please go to our website at phmurderstories.com and fill out the request form at File Your Blotter. Did you like this episode? Give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, or if you're listening on other platforms, kindly send us a review on our Facebook page or send us a tweet. You can also share our podcast to your Instagram and Facebook stories through Spotify. We're also inviting you to join our Facebook group, PH Murder Stories The Verdict, and participate in our discourse about true crime, both local and international. This group is a safe space for true crime and mystery fans like us who want to engage in thorough discussions about the subject. To all our listeners, we hope you could support us on Patreon. If you're fond of online shopping, you can also help our team earn a small commission by clicking our Lazada and Shopee affiliate links found in the description. Any amount you contribute will enormously help support our team to produce more quality content. The views and opinions expressed by the podcast creators, hosts, and guests do not necessarily reflect the official policy and position of Podcast Network Asia, the hosts of the program, or other programs of the network. Any content provided by the people on the podcast are of their own opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything.